Hey there, welcome to Takeaway with Sam Okus, a podcast from Nations Restaurant News. I am Sam Okus, editor in chief of NRN, and this is the show where I give you an all access pass to the restaurant industry's most influential decision makers. This week is a special episode as I'm sharing an interview that we hosted last week via LinkedIn Live. I was joined by Meredith Sandland and Carl Orsborn, who are the co authors of the new book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant The Path to Digital Maturity. And we had a great conversation about digital evolution in the restaurant industry, how this evolution is creating opportunities for brands to access and understand customers and their behaviors, and what has changed since Meredith and Carl wrote their first Delivering the Digital Restaurant book back in 2021. In this conversation, you will learn more about how brands should take advantage of food service tech and third-party partners, the role of ghost kitchens and virtual brands in the ongoing digital evolution, and what Meredith and Carl predict will be the next major category to take over the restaurant industry. Jumping now into my interview with Meredith Sandland and Carl Orsborn, the co-authors of the book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant, The Path to Digital Maturity. No takeaways on this one other than to, than to suggest that you go grab a copy of the book and connect with Meredith and Carl on LinkedIn for more. Don't forget to subscribe to Takeaway wherever you listen to podcasts and to leave your feedback. You can also email me at sam.ogus at informa.com. Enjoy the conversation. Have you heard about the California Food Service Instant Rebate Program? You can save up to $3,000 instantly on energy efficient food service equipment when you purchase from participating dealers. Find out more at www.caenergywise.com slash instant dash rebates and find a participating dealer near you. Skip the paperwork and save instantly on your food service equipment. That's www.caenergywise.com slash instant dash rebates. Okay, I am Sam Okus, Editor-in-Chief of Nations Restaurant News, and I am very happy to be joined by Meredith Sandland and Carl Orsborn, the co-authors of Delivering the Digital Restaurant, The Path to Digital Maturity. This is the second book that you guys have put out on digital restaurants. Uh, the first really was, oh, there they are right there. Beautiful. <laughs> we have props. Uh, the first book, you guys put out really a seminal book uh, in 2021, um, which was Delivering the Digital Restaurant, uh, the your roadmap to the future of food. Am I getting that right? I hope I got right. that. Um, yep. Um, and that one, I mean, that was everywhere because in 2021, when you guys put that book out, you know, this was a time where everybody was trying to figure out what does it mean to be a digital restaurant? Of course, this was in the thick of COVID. Um, so that book became, I think, very much um, uh, a foundational uh, piece of uh, a foundational resource for the industry to figure out what the heck was going on. So now you guys have put the second book out. Uh, as of today, it is out there for people to go buy. And this is talking about digital maturity. So we're going to get into that on this LinkedIn session. For those of you who are participating live, please throw out any questions or comments you have for Meredith or Carl, and we will happily ask them your questions um, otherwise, we're just going to chat about what's going on with this book. So, Meredith, Carl, thanks for joining. Let's just start with um, it's been a year and a half, almost two years now since you guys put out the first book. What's changed? How has the industry? I mean, it feels like that's that was light years ago. What has changed in the year and a half since you guys put out that first book? Yeah. Wow. So much. Um, I would say the number one thing that's changed is it's become evident that this is not the pandemic. Uh, this is not VC money. This is not the tech companies doing it to the restaurant industry. This is a change in the consumer. And that was that, honestly a huge part of why we wrote the first book was to make that argument. And that has indeed proven to be true. Um, we'll see where we settle into um, for total delivery as a percentage of sales post pandemic. But the consumer has fundamentally changed and that has proven to be the case. So that is certainly certainly a change. And then I think um, we're no longer in a state of emergency, right, where restaurants were trying to get online and figure out how to digitize in order to survive the pandemic. We're now at a point where they can step back and say, OK, what, how would we do this on purpose? I think that's right. For, for us, when we've spoken to many 
of the folks that enjoyed the first book, which of course was the context of that first book was it, it was the why, you know, why to treat digitization so seriously. The idea of the book came to us when we were speaking to restaurants at Kitchen United about ghost kitchens. And, you know, a lot of that, the, the mentality at that time was, well, is delivery a flash in the pan? Is this something really that we should take seriously? And of course, the pandemic solidified the role that delivery has. And I think really the role of that first book was to say, treat this seriously. This is going to be a really valuable channel in much the same way as drive through became such an important channel for QSRs. So, so that kind of decision is now in place. But really the challenge that many restaurants are facing today is that technology takes over the entirety of the restaurant ecosystem. And there are many, many different pieces of technology. We reckon somewhere between 15 to 20 for the average restaurant group out there that is being used across that portfolio, of, of, across the ecosystem. And we would guess that much of it isn't being used to its fullest potential. And so what does that mean? Well, we're in an era still of inflation, of course. And so a lot of restaurant executives are in a position where they're saying, well, what do we really need? What, what is the technology that we really need to be able to help us right now in this type of environment? And of course, some of that is revenue generation, but some of it is cost optimization. Some of it is automation. And I think our intent with this new book and the, the idea of a digital maturity pathway is to help restaurants find where they are today and to be able to say to them, look, you don't have to have this kind of spray and pray kind of approach anymore. It can actually be very focused on saying, really develop your maturity on your, on your restaurant for where you are right now before progressing to the next. And that will help from procurement, procurement practices, but it will also help the technology companies that are selling to restaurants to understand who is the right client for them as well. Sure. Yeah. And Carl, you, you made a comment that you think about 70 to 80 percent of restaurants you think are in these first two phases uh, of their maturity path. Now, you guys have eight chapters in the new book, which is roughly um, that's roughly eight phases, I think, that you guys have kind of laid out for digital maturity. You think 70, 80 percent of restaurants are in those first two phases. Tell me about what those two phases are, where you think most of the restaurants are. And what are the, what's the next steps that you see as being along that path to maturity? Yes, uh, we, we started off on this journey, actually. The, the, the idea of the, the second book, Sam, came as an additional chapter. That's how we approached it initially, would you believe? And so um, we started writing and we realized there was more to write. And, you know, as, as it plays out, we, we ended up with, with eight chapters. And so that's why it's in its own form of, as a new book. Um, Look, we, we think 70 to 80 percent are represented in those first two chapters because that is just the sentiment that we hear mostly talked about when talking about digital restaurants out there right now. The first chapter, it focuses in on marketplaces and we talk about it in the sense of discoverability because and maybe this was a bit contentious from the first book because Meredith and I are always saying marketplaces, DoorDashes, Uber Eats, the grub pubs of this world, are a vital cog in the overall restaurant ecosystem. They're a vital cog. And so while there is always that love-hate relationship that we again touched on in the first book, they really do need to be treated seriously. And so we're trying to encourage restaurants to be able to say, don't just think about that as sign up and then it's done. You have to optimize your presence on these marketplaces because um, it's almost like when the yellow pages first appeared. You know, the yellow pages initially might've been super thin, but today, because of the amount of restaurants that are on the DoorDashes and Uber Eats of this world, it's a huge yellow pages. And so you have to be found. And how do you do that? And so this first area and this first step on the pathway is talking about what many might consider the basics, but they are the vitally important parts of the infrastructure needed to build the digital house upon them. Hmm. Yeah, simply being on the third parties is not... Um, you can't check that box and call it done, right? There's a lot of work right. to optimize your presence on those third parties. And that's what that first chapter is about. And a lot of restaurants are still learning how to do that, um, how to do uh, what we would call search engine optimization or SEO on the third party platforms. They really are search engines for food. Um, so figuring out how to do that is something that's very new to the industry. And then uh, the second chapter, of course, is the holy grail everyone wants. Once you have been found, how do you convert your fans to ordering first party? Uh, and that is the next place that much of the industry finds itself, which is, okay, I'm on the third parties. I'm kind of learning how to maximize my presence on the third parties. But how do I get more consumers to order first party for me? And I'm sure you've seen the um, chart from Mipit data that shows some of the leading brands 
And they range from, you know, 10% of sales to 60% of sales coming first party. Hmm. Right. I mean, it's not, it's not like, yeah, I mean, yes, 60 is great, but like there's <laughs> a, a huge range. range there. And these <laughs> yeah. are some of the leading brands in America. It's it, getting people to switch from third party to first party is not something that I think that they're is yet a science around in the industry. So that's really the topic of the second chapter. And we do spend a lot of time in that second chapter talking about uh, UX, uh, mm. user experience, uh, and the importance of it. You, you can't convert someone. You can't convert a fan that perhaps enjoys your food unless you create an interface, an, or, an order flow that is as seamless and as frictionless, or at least as differentiated, you know, differentiated from the marketplaces. And we use this term count the clicks as a way of being able to talk to that in the sense of if you look at the best e-commerce out there, the Amazons of this world, as a registered user, you can go through in three steps to order an item from the homepage on Amazon. That's amazing, right? Uh, with DoorDash and Uber Eats, it's probably somewhere between five and six. But when you look at the most first party ordering platforms today, that could range from seven to 12 steps, if you will, to be able to go through the ordering process as a registered user. Those additional steps are additional reasons why I might as well just keep ordering from the marketplace. So we try to talk a bit about the importance of the design of that first party channel. Again, it's not just about choosing the right provider. It's about making sure you work with that provider to create a seamless interface. And even if you've got a, a fast casual concept or something where customization is super important, then again, embrace the way in which you can differentiate your, your brand, your offer through your first party channel, make it worthwhile for the customer to realize why ordering direct is not only cheaper and more seamless, but also it's a more fun too. Sure. Uh, let's talk about the third parties now, since we brought it up. I, I see a, a comment here says third party is toxic. Uh, you know, that <clears throat> that's a common sentiment from a lot of restaurateurs. Oh. Um, going back to the pandemic, a lot of restaurants were like, this is sort of a necessary evil, uh, you know, and it, it, you, you just have to be there because if you're not, you're missing out on all those customers, but they take so much off the top of every order. It's, it's a very tenuous relationship at best. Um, tell me what you guys think about the third parties, why you think the third party marketplaces are still uh, necessary and can also be good. What, how should restaurants approach their relationship with the third party marketplaces? Yeah, I mean, that is such a common sentiment that um, among restaurants that the, re the third parties are, um, I, I've heard things like toxic, necessary evil, words like that. Um, I think we find them to be very important. And they're important for a couple of reasons. The first one is that there are some consumers that are only ever going to order from those third parties, right? They are members of DoorDash, um, DashPass. They are members of Grubhub Plus. They are members of Uber One. That's how they get food. So if you as a restaurant want to access those consumers, you need to be on those platforms in order to be found. Now, you can make a choice to say, those are not my consumers. I don't care. <laughs> right. And if yeah. so, as long as you have an alternate marketing plan, that's great. Right. If, um, if you have a different way of serving consumers, if, say you're dine in only, and you're just not going to participate in delivery. Awesome. Second reason is that they are the, um, food courts, the modern food courts, right. And, you know, speaking as a former young executive, when we would go into new countries in the old days, we would go to the food court first at the mall. And why? Well, because every consumer in that country was traipsing through the food court and they would see your brand. You could teach them about it. You could expose them to the food. And yes, you paid through the nose for that, right? The rents were super high um, and it was difficult to make a go of it, but you got this incredible brand exposure out of it. Once you train the consumer on what your brand was, you were able to um, move them over into a street side or even a drive through location. And this is very similar, right? Like hungry yeah. consumers go to the third party platforms. And if you want to reach them and teach them about your brand, especially the younger consumers, that's the place where you go and do it. And then later you can move them over to the equivalent of street side, which is um, your first party platform, uh, assuming they become an ardent brand of yours and the uh, brand fan of yours. The, the follow up or corollary to that is if you're going to be on the third party platforms, it's a do or do not situation. There is no yeah. try, right? <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. if you were on the third party platforms, make it a great experience because no consumer is ever going to order from third party and go, well, that sucked and yeah. blame the marketplace and then come to your first party channel. That is not a thing that happens. So if you're going to be on the third party platforms, do it well, embrace it. And then you're going to have a chance to convince that person to come over. 
Um, so there's there's a lot there. Um, and then I think the final piece of it is around, you know, how do you make it work for you? And then um, that's probably around pricing, um, absolute pricing, dynamic pricing. And then um, there's a certain point, I will call it the tipping point, um, probably around 30% of sales where the marginal economics break down. It does not work. No amount of pricing is going to make it work. And at that point, you really, as a restaurant brand, need to start thinking about a dedicated channel that is delivery optimized. I want to um, just, uh, stick on uh, just other uh, vendors, tech vendors for a moment, because Carl, you mentioned that uh, 15 to 20 pieces of technology in the average restaurant, uh, that's incredible, right? I mean, that's that's overwhelming, really. I mean, there's so many food, food tech companies out there serving the industry. And uh, Meredith, you made this comment uh, when we spoke previously about the fact that it feels like we just kind of keep creating these problems that need to be solved by another tech solution. Every time we adapt to this new tech thing, it requires something else. Um, I, can you guys comment really quick just on the state of food service tech and the, all of these com companies that are serving the industry? What is a restaurant operator to do? How, how do you uh, look at all of these tech vendors that are out there, pick the ones that are right for you and build a tech stack that's efficient without being overwhelming? Yeah, in, um, in, in our new book, we, we follow the same path as we did with the first one in the sense of putting these little fictional vignettes of trying to help set the scene as to what it feels like for an average restaurant owner operator as they're faced with the decisions around making um, what which procurement choices and which technologies they need. I, I think that the main the main challenge here is is that restaurant technology generally has overpromised and underdelivered. If I'm being frank, and I think we all um, and obviously Meredith and I are now part of restaurant technology companies ourselves. We all owe it to restaurants to do a better job of qualifying whether the restaurant is indeed ready for that right piece of technology and also helping them understand how it can truly help them in their bottom line economics. So I think part of this is about making sure that the restaurant is in a place of maturity, hence the reason we talk about the path to digital maturity, to accept those different pieces of technology and to also be mindful of what is starting to happen in our space, and that is a level of consolidation. So um, in one way, you could say, what about these providers out there that are saying, well, we can do this and we can do that, and we can do this, and you just have to deal with us, which sounds very, very appealing and attractive. And that might work for someone who has no huge level of problem or opportunity that they're going after. But if someone has got a, um, let's say, an employee scheduling challenge, a major problem with being able to really optimize their labor, do they want to go down the pathway of a aggregated service which does also employ scheduling? Or do they need a, a seven shifts or someone that truly is focused in that area? So I think it's about the restaurant assessing the size of the prize or the opportunity or the scale and size of the problem and making a decision based on that. But then it's also about how that technology integrates with all the other parts of the technology. And this, again, is where a lot of the problems occur uh, within the ecosystem right now. It's almost like we need a an operating system, like it works with an Apple iPhone, where everything can work together a bit more seamlessly. Today, that is something that I think some are thinking about, but we need to get more in that direction. Yeah, I know that data is a, is a big part of this, right? And um, that can bring us back to the conversation around e-commerce, um, because you guys have mentioned this term e-commerce um, and of course, when we think e-commerce, we think of Amazon, we think of the retail giants. Um, but for those who have not naturally connected the food service world and what we're doing digitally in food service to the term e-commerce, explain what this might mean for a restaurant, how that can become the first party delivery um, platform, what this even looks like for a restaurant and how they should be pursuing that, that approach. Yeah, absolutely. I think... <sighs> So restaurants know the data is important. We talk about it all the time as an industry, um, controlling your own data, making sure that the data doesn't end up on someone else's platform, making sure that your customer remains your customer and not a marketplace's customer. These things are super important. But I'm not sure as an industry we've figured out what to do with the data or why it's important. There's a couple of leaders who are doing really, really well with it. Um, but not everyone is there yet. And of course, I think the first thing we all naturally think of is personalization, right? If I know a consumer, what they order, when they order it, I can be like Netflix and offer them the right thing at the right time, and they're going to keep coming back. Um, and that is certainly one use case for the data. 
Um, you know, another one might be lookalike audiences, you know, find me all of the people, oh, internet, find me all of the people who look like the people who already love me. Um, but the way an e-commerce company works is that they, um, they follow what's called an e-commerce funnel, right? And so they know who's coming in at an aggregate level, not is Carl coming in, but all the people, are they coming in? Are they clicking on menu items? Are they putting them in their basket? Are they actually, you know, converting that basket and, and checking out what's happening at each stage of the funnel? And really sophisticated e-commerce companies are able to see where they're losing people over the course of that funnel. And they're able to A-B test different ways of engaging with consumers at each stage to see how you can best keep people in the funnel. Because if someone comes in, they are interested. So the question is, yeah. how do you get them all the way through to convert and purchase from you? Mm. Yeah, and then, and then in our new book, uh, The Path to Digital Maturity, we, we talk about the importance of data. And, you know, the old phrase, I think it was a British economist that said back in the early 2000s, data, you know, data is the new oil, right? And it's so true in this, in this time. And I think now that we've getting a greater representation, not just in terms of off-premise, you know, the fact is customer data can be tracked across all channels. You're actually able to understand whether the customer that comes in at the weekend with their family but then orders delivery on a Tuesday night when they're running late from coming home from work. Those are two different channels, but that customer is still the same customer. And so therefore this idea of a lifetime value and the metrics attributed to e-commerce, um, like at the cost of customer acquisition to lifetime value, for example, these are metrics that we introduce in the book that are very commonly used across e-commerce companies. They are the things that now are going to be a way to be able to truly measure the performance and success of digital restaurants. Mm. Thinking about e-commerce, of course, again, going back to like the Amazon example, it feels like an e-commerce strategy in my head. I'm like, OK, well, that's for the big companies. That's for the major chains. McDonald's and Yum are going to figure that out. But the little guys, how could they ever afford such a solution or figure that out or manage their data? Uh, but I, I know that's that's not true these days. But tell me about your advice for emerging restaurateurs when it comes to building out an e-commerce strategy. How do you do this for you know, an independent restaurant or a small chain and and not have to go the whole Amazon approach to it, I guess you could say. Mm, yeah, well, the, you know, the amazing thing about SaaS, software as a service, is that it makes available to everyone what historically was only available to really large chains who had, you know, tech departments and purchasing departments and all of those things and spend millions of dollars either building or buying uh, some kind of software. And now everyone can get it for a small monthly fee, right? Now, the challenge with that is, of course, you've got to then manage these 15 to 20 different things. But if I think about, you know, the e-commerce corollary, something like Shopify took all of those things and combined them together and gave them back to independent sellers on the internet and said, well, here's how you do it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of thing is certainly coming uh, in the restaurant space as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So I want to talk about um, virtual brands and ghost kitchens because it felt like, you know, in 2020, 2021, those were the two buzziest of buzzwords. Um, those were, you know, virtual brands became how so many restaurants could stay afloat to create some extra revenue opportunity. Uh, ghost kitchens, of course, could facilitate virtual brands, also facilitate expansion of existing brands. Felt like all we could talk about uh, in 2020 and 2021 was virtual brands, ghost kitchens. Uh, less so in 2023, uh, virtual brands, you know, I, I don't get as much across my desk about virtual brand development as I, I got two years ago, uh, but especially ghost kitchens. When you look at what's going on with ghost kitchens right now, we've actually seen some, some pullback. Wendy's uh, announced they're going to pull back from ghost kitchens, Burger Fry, another one. Um, I, I'm curious to hear from you guys, what is the role uh, ghost kitchens and virtual brands play in the digital restaurant ecosystem? Where do you see those two? Um, strategies playing a role in digital restaurants? Love this question. Um, and I know Meredith is going to have lots to say about it as well. So I'll take a, a few seconds and then let her finish it off. Um, look, that, first of all, it's important to differentiate them, right? And we, we talk about the, the, the differences between them in, in the book, but we also try to help folks figure out what is the right model for them. So ghost kitchens are just used as a term or dark kitchens are used as a term, but the reality is there are different business models out there which fall under the ghost kitchen umbrella. And so being able to really understand where your strengths are, are you a great operator? Or is it your brand that truly is your strength? 
starting from that standpoint and then being able to say, well, what are the ghost kitchen business models out there that help me? Those are things that we try to cover within the book. Same uh, approach with, with virtual brands, quite honestly. But we also place it in the second half of this pathway to digital maturity, because in many ways, ghost kitchens out there have had a lot of negative press because of some of the challenges early, earlier in the digital maturity pathway. And that comes down to, can you generate enough sales to be able to make it the economics work? And so if you're not in a place where you can actually get enough sales coming through, it doesn't matter whether you've got a ghost kitchen infrastructure or you're trying to do it in your own brick and mortar restaurant, you're always going to have that level of struggle. And I think really, if you approach this from the standpoint of really being able to build your ability on the marketplaces, first party, starting utilizing your data in all the right ways, again, you're going to have the right infrastructure to make ghost kitchens and virtual brands a great way to be able to grow your representation as a digital restaurant. And with that, that is why we think it's something you've got to appropriately look at at the right time for your growth journey. Yeah, I think there were some uh, ghost kitchens that brought in a lot of new operators, you know, they, they said, oh, this is a great low barrier to entry way to get into the restaurant industry. Well, if you've got a new operator who's not super experienced and they don't know anything about digital marketing, you can see why that would not work out pretty well. Now, obviously, you know, big brands like Wendy's and Burger Fire are a little bit different, but um, not knowing their situation specifically, what I would say is a ghost kitchen is asset light. It does reduce the break even of opening a new restaurant by about 50%. That's amazing. But for anyone who's listening carefully, uh, most people have, I don't know, 30, 40% of their sales in delivery if they're doing really, really well. So you brought the break even down by half, you reduce my sales potential by 60 to 70%. Ooh, wow, that's not going to work, right? And unless uh, you're a brand who really understands digital marketing, really understands these e-commerce tactics... It's going to be hard to make a ghost kitchen work, um, regardless of who's operating or what model it is, right? So I think as we start to see much more sophistication around digital marketing, uh, the ghost kitchens absolutely make sense because they are, number one, asset light, and number two, completely optimized for an off-premise experience. And the more delivery um, and takeout that your brand is doing, the less and less it makes sense to have you know, a 6,000 square foot restaurant in a sea of parking. I see that uh, according to our comments, uh, some people agree with you and some people do not. Um, some people <laughs> still think this is a fad. Some people are, are totally behind you. And Meredith, I know you mentioned something um, to me before, which was um, around sort of the, 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 the fact that if you're just a ghost kitchen, um, then yeah, you're going to struggle if you're, if you're all of your eggs on in this basket of, um, well, here's this ghost kitchen and it needs to work for me for delivery and it's not working for me for de delivery. Therefore let's, let's bail. But you talked about, you know, if you use it for catering, if you use it for first party and third party, um, that there is a way to develop sort of a, a full suite of sort of the omni-channel, I guess, strategy around ghost kitchens. Do you see, is that where you see this going into the future? I mean, where does ghost kitchen go from here um, as far as, because I, I feel like I've seen a lot of evolution with ghost kitchens mm -hmm. is, you know, we're, we're seeing some digital food halls, um, you know, a lot of other kind of creative applications of ghost kitchen. What's your personal take on where ghost kitchens go? From yeah, there? I mean, I think there's two paths, right? There's the one path that is going more omni-channel and that's what Kitchen United has done very, very well, um, making a sort of digital food hall, putting it inside of a Kroger type asset where there's a lot of footfall, um, using it for catering, takeout, delivery, both third party and first, uh, building a tech stack around first party to help drive that. Um, all of those things I think are fantastic and that makes it a more robust business model. The opposite path is to say, no, no, we're going to super focus only on delivery but we are going to be so good at delivery, uh, both in terms of operationally bringing it to life, but then also driving the digital marketing to drive the sales, that we are going to make just that channel work. Um, and a good example of that would be Cluster Truck. Um, and I think they've done a very good job of being hyper focused on delivery and in so doing, doing it very well. You know, the, the thing I think about this is that any transaction that's going through a ghost kitchen, virtual brands uh, whether, or, or, or core brand, it's got to be the most optimal experience for the guest. So I mean, super fast. If, if you've got something coming out of a ghost kitchen that takes 45, 50, 55 minutes to deliver, are you truly giving the most optimal experience for your own guest? 
I, I think that's the big question we've got to ask ourselves here is how can you create a system that ultimately improves the guest experience? The off-premise guest experience today is not great. You know, they were tolerant. The guest was tolerant of us during the pandemic. They knew the industry was having a tough time. But now the expectations are starting to rise. Those folks that are operating, whether it be in a brick and mortar or in a ghost kitchen type of setup, that are really thinking about how to optimize the guest experience. What do I mean? I mean, obviously, no accuracy issues, great quality in terms of the food. And that also means, you know, not just generic chicken wings brands, but actually niche, exotic, different types of foods that you, can, you can't get anywhere else. And then, of course, timeliness. If you can address speed, quality, and accuracy and actually do that, then you're actually truly utilizing uh, the ability of what ghost kitchens can offer. Problem is today is that's not happening. Why is that happening? Well, it's happening because restaurants have brought their model of operating of how they work in a brick and mortar restaurant into a ghost kitchen context. You can't do that. If Imagine you have a, a restaurant today that runs as it normally runs, and then you build on a drive through just on the side, and you don't change anything else. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to get errors. You're going to get problems. It's not going to be fast. That's why QSRs had to redefine the way in which their back of house operation works, the multiple make lines. All of those things happened. And as a result, drive through is a fantastic experience for a guest. Delivery needs to be the same. Part of it, and we cover this in the book, part of it is about core operations, nothing to do with technology, but core operations. But the other part, as we get onto later in the book, is then the ability to create interdependent technology that can ultimately give the guest the best type of experience. Yeah, we have a comment here um, from Taylor M says, virtual brands must have packaging and marketing support to be successful. You can't just add a virtual brand without the proper assets. Let's talk about sort of the marketing component of the digital restaurant, <clears throat> because I do, I, I agree with that. You know, the packaging and marketing support have to be there. You have to build a brand still, even if you don't have the billboard, the brick and mortar. Um, tell me, you know, what is your, what are your recommendations from a marketing standpoint for as you develop a digital restaurant strategy? How can you ensure that the marketing is also there to to do the branding, to do the work, the outreach that you can connect with customers? Yeah, you know, I think it depends a little bit on what your objectives for the virtual brand are. Um, so, for example, if you're using uh, virtual branding as an SEO tool to show up in different kinds of searches. You're a steak restaurant and you're serving salad is the example we use in the book. And you're trying to drive your salad sales at the lunch day part. So you create a salad brand. Um, you might not need as much marketing support because it's truly just all the exact same ingredients riding on the base restaurant. You know, any incremental sales you're happy with, that's fine. But if you are trying to create um, a virtual brand or suite of virtual brands to truly drive the business, then yeah, they've got to be real brands. And if you don't have that brick and mortar support to teach consumers about what those brands are, what they stand for, how they work, then you've got to have the internet, you know, kind of doing that for you. And I think, um, you know, as I look at what happened in the creation of digitally native vertical brands in e-commerce, right, in apparel and CPG, what they did in order to accomplish that certainly was a lot of very specific digital marketing on the social media platforms, but then they created an experience that you could only have digitally, right? You couldn't, it was better because the way that they, you know, say Warby Parker had you try on glasses was something that you could only do digitally. And it was awesome, right? And as restaurants figure out how to do the equivalent of that, I think then they will be able to share their experience and share their brand story digitally. And that hasn't emerged yet. I think the closest we've seen, and Carl, tell me if you disagree, is probably the Itsu app where you make the bento box um, and maybe Kava as well, where you're adding the toppings, uh, where truly the digital experience is different um, from what you would be able to do if you went in store. Yeah. And where's this going to head? You know, again, look look to the Amazons of this world. Your home screen, Sam, on Amazon is different to mine. But guess what? Even if you and I bought exactly the same items on Amazon at the same time over the last five years, we would still have a different home screen. And why is that? Well, because Amazon is constantly testing different things. They're doing this thing called A-B testing, right? In another e-commerce term, where they've been able to compare how one particular window or one particular product is compared to another. And we, we often encourage restaurants to think about 
doing plenty of A-B testing themselves and using their first party platform as a way of doing that. And that could be approaching a photo from this way versus this way or changing the word and description in different ways to be able to see which kind of leverages the most level results. I think that is um, a spirit of experimentation that digitization brings to restaurants that perhaps previously wouldn't be possible. You know, everything with my company, with what I'm doing with Juicer and, and dynamic pricing and helping restaurants optimize their pricing capability is done because in the old days, you know, you, you couldn't change paper menus as regularly um, as you can now with digital menus. And so in that sense, you're able to think about how digitization is opening new doors of opportunity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, as, as we come uh, toward the end of our conversation here, just a reminder, everybody watching, if you have questions for Carl and Meredith, this is a great opportunity to ask them questions now. Um, so Carl, Meredith, you guys have a, a bold proclamation in your book um, that you think that there is going to be a category that emerges in the restaurant industry that you compare to the fast casual industry emerging 10, 15 years ago. Tell me about what is this category you see coming what does that look like and what should those watching the restaurant tours watching know about that category and how they might be able to participate? Yeah, well, first of all, I would say this is the history of the restaurant industry. Growth is constantly being driven by a new concept type, not, not necessarily a specific brand, but a new concept type. And uh, as you go back and think about fine dining, evolving to family dining, evolving to QSR, evolving to delivered pizza to casual dining to fast casual, right? There's like this new wave of growth that um, comes in and drives the industry forward. And it doesn't mean that the old version goes away, right? We still have fine dining. It just means that that's where the growth is driven from. And we haven't really had one of those since the creation of fast casual. And while it feels like delivery is the thing that's changing, um, and certainly it is, it has not yet resulted in a totally new concept type. I think there's been a lot of experimentation with ghost kitchens and various forms of them and virtual brands and various forms of them. But if you think about a concept that is able to combine ghost kitchens and virtual brands and digital interfaces and e-commerce marketing tactics and maybe electric cooking and robotics, all those different things into one package, you're going to end up with a fundamentally different kind of concept. And I think that concept will bring more value and more convenience to the consumer and it will win, right? Because if you tell a consumer, hey, I have a super easy way for you to get food and it's going to be higher quality or higher quantity than what you're used to getting for that same 10 bucks or 20 bucks, consumers are going to be all in. And as soon as consumers are all in on that, it just becomes a snowball, similar to how all those other concept types uh, took over. But it comes with a caveat. It comes with a caveat in the sense of you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision as to how you wish to run your restaurant, because to be able to go down that particular pathway, it does really mean, how would you do something like this? How would you create a digitally native restaurant company? And that really means the operating system needs to change. The technology needs to change in an appropriate way so that you can actually create that optimized experience, which is why the final chapter of the book, we start talking about the concept of holistic technology. In fact, in many ways, we, we speak to the technologists, not to the restaurants in that final chapter, where we say to them, look, to, for restaurants truly to reach digital maturity, the technology needs to be able to work together better. It needs to work more in an interdependent type fashion. It needs to be able to enable the data flows to move beyond simple APIs where the function is speaking to the other function to now where actually it becomes almost a symbiotic relationship. And the example we refer to in the book is imagine a world where when you have two line cooks that call out tonight ill, that data point that might be coming through your scheduling platform now speaks to other parts of the overall operating system. For example, on OpenTable, maybe now your reservations are restricted, or maybe you're through systems like mine with Juicer where the pricing perhaps goes up a little bit on off-premise. All these different things will enable the restaurant to have a better way of operating as a result of that particular stimuli. That's the type of thing that the technologists need to figure out. And ultimately, to deliver upon a digitally native new category, restaurants will need to have that type of capability to truly give the guests the best experience. Uh, somebody had pointed out in the comments, you know, dine-in is, is back um, and, and isn't going anywhere. I think we can all agree that, you know, dine-in, people still want to go out to restaurants. I'm curious, you know, a digital native restaurant, uh, I think some people might consider that notion as being 
sterile or they might think of it as being, you know, oh, without the sort of overall experience you get out of a restaurant. Um, so anybody who's listening who owns a, a brick and mortar restaurant but still wants to develop a digitally native brand, how do you make those two things work together? How do you how do you have that brick and mortar presence and also go totally into this digital approach? Well, I believe they have to be separate. Um, you cannot do them both out of the same building. And so that might mean that you have a dine-in or five or 10 different dine-in restaurants, maybe even 10 different dine-in brands where you're running an excellent dine-in experience. And, you know, like I said, it just because something new comes out doesn't mean the old ones are going away. What's been happening in the restaurant industry for years and years and years is that consumers are moving from grocery over to restaurant. And they're doing that as these new innovations come out, right? So you can keep doing your dine-in, do it great. But if you want to be in the high growth channel, you need to de develop a digitally native restaurant. And that is going to most likely be in a purpose-built facility operating on purpose-built uh, software that is uh, fully optimized for delivery in every single way. All right, um, Carl Meredith, what are some practical steps you think that restaurant operators should take right now to start on their path to digital maturity? Obviously, there's probably people all over the spectrum here, um, but what, what do you think they should do to just get themselves moving in that direction? Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you see how I set you up for that one? That was a good yeah, my, idea. I, 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 you would be my friend. Uh, no, I, 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 think, I think clearly... Um, Checking out delivering the digital restaurant, the first copy, um, your roadmap to the future of food, and this latest one, the, the path to digital maturity. So they complement each other really nicely. Um, the other part of this that Meredith and I are incredibly passionate about is trying to help restaurants ultimately. That's the reason we wrote the book. Um, and so we have our podcast called The Digital Restaurant, and we talk about the change in times and the ways in which different things are happening on that podcast to, to really help folks almost navigate through the fog um, so that they're aware of the change in trends. So I would encourage, you know, obviously tune into our podcast, but there are ones like uh, what Nations Restaurant News puts out there that really help you be able to keep a finger on the pulse. That's really important. But more than anything, if there's one thing I could say you fit for every restaurant to do, it's find your spot, your spot right now. Focus in on that. Don't try and be everything to everyone, because if you do that, you're going to be average to everyone. And there's a lot of average out there. Meredith, anything to add? Oh, I think that was very well said. Yeah, certainly by the book. And, um, you know, we, in my old, old days, I was at Bain a long time ago as a consultant, and we would say profit from the core all the time. Profit from the core. The best way to make money is to do one thing and do it really, really well. And in the last few years, because of the pandemic, because of the explosion of technology, um, we have all tried to be all things to all people. And that is... Um, most likely a recipe for disaster, right? So pick your lane, pick what you're good at, uh, and figure out how to double down on those things uh, and do them really well. Well, I can tell our audience another good next step is uh, if you go to nrn.com slash speaker box, there are several articles from Carl and Meredith that you can uh, read and digest and lots of wisdom in those articles. Uh, but yes, you can also go by the book. Where, where can they go to get this book? Uh, is it widely available now? Tell us more, where, where can they go? Yeah, so you can obviously go, to, if you're a marketplace supporter, there is a small retailer out there called Amazon. And on Amazon, you can get a Kindle version, you can get a paperback version. And I think in a couple of days, the hardback will be on Amazon as well. Um, of course, if you prefer first parties, you can head to our website, which is uh, deliveringthedigitalrestaurant.com. Uh, there you'll be able to also buy both books for a combo deal of $30. Or if you'd like to get um, a combo of the books in bulk, maybe for your clients, for other peers in the industry, you can also buy in bulk there. So uh, check out deliveringthedigitalrestaurant.com. You can learn more about Meredith, myself, the podcast, and our other articles there. Mm -hmm. And fear not, uh, the audiobook version is on its way and it is read by Carl. So you get to listen to his voice and not mine, which is good news, I think, for everyone. And uh, he has finished reading and now it is in the, uh, the polishing phase with the audio engineer. So that's coming soon. Very cool. Well, Meredith Sandlin and Carl Orsborn, guys, thank you so much, as always, for your expertise and for participating in this. Really appreciate it. Congratulations on the new book and good luck to you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much.